So hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to our first webinar of 2022. Uh, welcome back for those of you who've been with us for a while and welcome to those who are new. Um, today, we're really excited for this session. It'll be uh, our first formal panel style session. So we haven't done one of these yet and we're really excited. We've invited three awesome speakers to be with us here today uh, to represent all different avenues to arrive at the, the MSL destination. So we've invited um, a PhD, so Dr. Ren J. Shea, an MD, Dipti Patel, and a PharmD, George Lyman. And he will, all three of these panelists will introduce themselves separately. So you can kind of choose to follow along, uh, along each of their paths and get to know them a little bit more. But before we begin, we're just gonna read a quick disclaimer that's associated with our webinar. Um, and that is Ask and Tell with MSLs is an independent non-promotional webinar series that serves as a communication tool for people interested in learning about medical science liaisons and related careers. It is not affiliated, associated, authorized, endorsed by, or in any way officially connected to any university, agency, company, or organization. Um, webinar sessions will be held live and are not distributed or repurposed without permission. So as you all registered, that last question on the registration form was just to make sure that you're all okay with the recording and posting this to YouTube. And so that disclaimer is sort of a blanket statement for all three of our panelists today. So without further ado, I will let each of them introduce themselves. You want to start with uh, Renjay? Sure. Thanks, Renee. And um, also, thanks for posting this on YouTube. This will be the first time I've ever been on YouTube, so I feel very honored. Awesome. Um, but just as a matter of introduction, welcome, everyone. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, as Renee said, my, my name is Renjay Shea. I am uh, an MSL with Coherus Biosciences. And just like a, a really, really super quick overview, I did my PhD at Indiana University in exercise physiology and then a, a postdoc down at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in the Cystic Fibrosis Research Center before hopping over to the industry um, just over just under three years ago. And I see Heather's in the audience here and uh, shout out to Heather for helping me get my first MSL job. Awesome, thanks. Dipti, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying I'm so grateful um, to Heather as well, because Heather got me my first MSL role. Um, so shout out to Pharma Finders and uh, to Renee and Lindsay. So it's wonderful being on this side of, um, you know, the divide, because I used to watch these webinars and found them incredibly useful and a great resource. So it's wonderful you guys are all here. Um, a bit of background on me. Uh, as you can tell from my accent, I come from the UK. Uh, so I did my medical degree at Imperial College and following that did two years of adult medicine uh, with an interest in gastro and then specialized in pediatrics and neonatology. Uh, and I'm now living in LA and started as an MSL at Malincroft just quite recently. Great, thanks, Dipti. And George? Hello, I'm George Liman. I am uh, currently serving as the medical liaison for Texas, uh, for Novo Nordisk. My territory is in Texas, so I have a huge state to cover. I am a family by training, had some experience as an educator and as an accountant, so I had to put all of that together to tell my story. I'm quite excited to be here. Um, Heather, thank you again for all the support throughout the journey. I started my role sometime in August, so I'm kind of new um, and, and looking forward to sharing my journey with everyone. Awesome, thank you, George. And welcome everyone who's just entering. Uh, we were, just went through introductions and now we're gonna jump right into some of the questions that were submitted by registrants. So the, the style for today's panel will be kind of rotating throughout um, three subcategories. So for PhD, MD and PharmD sub questions, um, and then at the end, we'll have some time for some general questions that MSLs from all backgrounds can answer and then some open Q&A from the chat. So if you have any questions that have not been addressed, feel free to drop those in the chat and we'll try to address them later. All right, so let's kick off our questions with one for a PhD background. So Renjay, spotlight's on you first. Um, somebody submitted a question about 
the familiar familiarity that PhDs may be lacking with um, clinical trials and clinical research before applying for MSL positions. So coming from that preclinical basic science background, how do you address this potential gap? No, that's a great question. It's, I think it's one that we hear all the time. And I think it's probably one of the more challenging things. Uh, you know, in my mind, everyone's background carries something valuable. So certainly don't uh, undervalue yourself just because you don't have X, Y, or Z on your resume. That just means you have, you know, an opportunity to grow in that area. With that being said, you know, in my experience, it, it is definitely crucial to have an understanding, a really good working understanding of the ins and outs of clinical research. Um, just because that's a, a lot of uh, what you're going to be involved in. You're either going to be reading it or evaluating it or discussing it or even helping, you know, shepherd um, proposals in from, from KOLs externally into your company who might be proposing um, clinical research. So definitely having a good understanding of it is, is without a doubt a, a necessity. So um, the, the tough part then is, that, you know, if you work in a basic science lab or if you work in a preclinical lab, how do you get it? Well, I would say if you're in a place that does basic science, chances are your university has some type of um, translational science, um, a CTSA, if you will. So those of you who, who are familiar with the, N with the NIH, um, a CTSA is a clinical and translational science um, uh, awardee site. It's usually administered through NCATS, so this National um, Center for Advancing Translational Science, which is part of the NIH. Um, for example, UAB's CTSA is called the CCTS, the Clinical and Translational Science um, Center. And what these centers do is they essentially help connect investigators from basic translational and, and clinical sciences so that you kind of get this robust network of people that you can collaborate with, you know, say you have a, um, an idea that you need a clinical partner with, or maybe you have a clinical partner who needs some help elucidating mechanism or really diving down into some more basic type of research um, to answer, you know, some, um, some questions. Maybe they submitted a paper and the reviewer asked them to do more mechanistic studies and they need a partner with a core, um, core service, you know, like a bioenergetics core, imaging core, something like that. So see if your university has a CTSA. If, if if they do, um, chances are they offer some kind of um, clinical translational science training program. And that's a really, really good place to start um, learning about clinical research and kind of what a phase one trial is, what a phase two trial is, the biostats considerations and ethical things. Um, and and uh, if you don't have a CTSA, a lot of times, uh, you know, you might be able to partner with uh, uh, some kind of third party, you know, whether it's Khan Academy, LinkedIn Learning or something like that. There's a lot of really good resources out there um, that, that can let you at least somewhat educate yourself um, beyond, you know, what, what you might have in your lab. So uh, without <laughs> uh, apologies for the long answer, but uh, hopefully that helps give a little um, color to that. Thanks, Renjay. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good point and definitely a question I see coming up all the time, like I'm sure you do too, like how do I make up for my lack of clinical experience? So yeah, I think those are some good resources for people to start, start with. And then the other, I mean, sorry, uh, you know, you, you made me think of one other thing. A lot of times there are people in your department who uh, might be doing clinical research or they might be doing, uh, you know, uh, company sponsored research or something like that. For example, my postdoc lab, you know, we probably had six or seven industry contracts going at any given time. So uh, chances are, if you look around, if you poke around your university, somebody is probably doing that, that type of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. All right, so now we are just going to shift gears a tiny bit and we're going to move on to our MD question uh, for Deep Deep. So this was an interesting question we got um, that I feel you'll be able to speak to. Um, the person asked, how do you maintain professionalism and compliance as an HCP with a professional degree such as MD when in the role of MSL? Yeah, that's again, a really good question. Um, so as you guys will become aware, compliance is really important in the industry. Um, so initially it's um, definitely a little tricky kind of navigating that transition and remembering that you are representative of your company. 
Um, what you do have in common with the physicians that you're interacting with is that commonality and understanding of science and medicine. Um, so when having these conversations, you've just got to remember the compliance. So make sure that you're maintaining the integrity and honesty that you have done when you've been working as a physician. And really, it's all about just creating mutually beneficial relationships. So remember that going forward. Yeah, I think that's really important. Across all MSL jobs, compliance comes up almost on a daily basis. So you make really great points. Thanks. And we're going to follow that up with a question for George with a PharmD background. So one of the questions that was submitted comes from somebody with a PharmD, but no industry contacts. And they're wondering what is the best way to get uh, my first MSL job? And maybe you could speak to a few of the, the options or avenues that could lead to an MSL job. Great. And I appreciate the question because it shows that the person has done some research. So it's an excellent question. They need those contacts. And we have different avenues. This is one of the ways to get those contacts. You are speaking and engaging with people. And this is an opportunity to kind of follow up even offline. So when I used to attend Ask and Tell with MSL, I am waving at everybody, right? So I'm reaching out, I am connecting and all that. That is how you build that network, which is all what this role is about, building network to help you get in. And when you get it, you would need to continue to expand that network to help you succeed in the role. So my advice to the person who asked the question is attend webinars like this. There are other um, avenues. If you have a conference around your region that you can attend and meet people. If you connect with people on LinkedIn, make it a real relationship. So we've moved past the point of I know this person to the point of this person knows me. So even if you send a request to someone on LinkedIn, you want to make it a personal uh, relationship such that when comes the time you need information, they can really freely um, get it back to you. I have a number of people who have just sent me connection requests. I accept it. Um, I think I don't know them as much as someone I have met on a platform like this. So I think the person already knows what they have to do. Get out there, put yourself out there, attend events like this one. Awesome. I think that's great advice. And really, I think that's advice that can uh, be used for any background that you're coming from, MD, PhD. It's really important, like George said, to make meaningful relationships. Um, and that can really start on LinkedIn. Great. So we're going to move back to Renje with another question. Um, Let's see, so one question is, does having a postdoc or prof professional training in a specific field limit the option to apply for an MSL role in other fields? So of your background from your postdoc, maybe it's in oncology, does that limit you to only oncology MSL positions? That's a great question. Um, and I, I'll give the standard answer of yes and no. <laughs> um, you know, I think it comes down to a couple things. Number one is, you know, uh, what, how can you transfer what your skills and experience are to whatever role you're applying for? It, if it, um, if your background lines up with what the role is going to require, then I think there's no, it doesn't hurt you to apply. Um, but that being said, you know, if you have extensive training in one therapeutic area, oncology or neurology or, you know, ophthalmology, whatever it is, you know, your best chance of getting a role is going to be in that therapeutic area. Um, my, um, the, the hiring manager who hired me for my first job, you know, she kind of told me that what she likes to, to think about is, you know, I'd like to either hire someone who either has previous experience uh, and can learn a new therapeutic area or someone who knows the therapeutic area and doesn't necessarily have MSL experience, but what I want, because I can train them in one or the other pretty easily, but what I don't want to do is hire someone who neither has MSL experience and also doesn't have therapeutic area experience because having to train them to be in as MSL and train them in a new, in a new therapeutic area is a lot um, to, to ask of, you know, the team. So uh, I would advise you to stick Stick close to home in terms of therapeutic area when you're when you're looking for your first job, 
just because you know you don't have previous MSL experience, so you can lean on your on your uh, therapeutic area expertise. And then once you're in the role and you already have MSL experience, it becomes a lot easier to move over, uh, around different therapeutic areas. Like I, I have a background in respiratory physiology, and my uh, current position is more in oncology and ophthalmology. So uh, I have no idea what I'm doing right now, but that that's a story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> and I just add a point to that as well. Um, so just echoing that as a point of reference, um, that Samuel Dai, who a lot of you guys might know, and if you don't, definitely check out the MSL Society. Um, tons of really wonderful and free resources. Um, but Samuel Dyer in a webinar I attended mentioned that 99% of MSLs get roles in therapeutic areas that align with their backgrounds. So the chances, he said, are very, very slim of... Um, getting rolled outside that. Yeah, thanks so much, Dipti and Rente. I've heard similar uh, sentiments from many other first time MSLs that they had much better luck applying into roles that more closely aligned with their research backgrounds and therapeutic areas that they had the most experience in. So I think that's really awesome advice. And I see a question from Shay in the in the chat. Good to uh, good to see you, Shay. Um, uh, the question is, how close to home should you stay, as in uh, the role within your TA, but a different disease, or should you stick in your TA and your disease? And I would say um, either either is probably fine. You know, if it's in your, you know, if you're a, for example, like for me, um, I'm. I told you earlier, I'm, I have a background in respiratory physiology. Specifically, my postdoc work was in cystic fibrosis, but I was applying to other respiratory positions. And ultimately, the one I um, ended up in was in critical care and pulmonary hypertension. So um, certainly, I think it, it helps to, um, you know, not be too silo or too pigeonholed, but, but definitely play to your strengths, so to speak. Hopefully, that helps. Yeah, that's great advice. Thanks. So we have an interesting question coming from somebody with a medical background for UDIPT. We had a few of these that were related. Uh, they're wondering, how do you play your clinical experience to your advantage? So coming from somebody who has had a, a many years of clinical experience, how do you effectively highlight those skills and explain how that background will be able to effectively transition into an MSL position? Um, and this is a great question because it was one that I worried about when I was first starting to make that transition, um, that a lot of my skills I felt were um, related to the practical skills that I brought and, you know, my ability to interact with patients, but mainly my knowledge base, really. Um, it starts right from the beginning. So from your LinkedIn profile, um, it shouldn't just be a list of all of your clinical achievements. You've got to look at the job descriptions. Um, so actually look at MSL job postings. And when you start looking at them, you'll see that there's running trends of what their expectations in an MSL are. So for example, great communication skills. So these are all skill sets that as a clinician you already have. Um, and so you just make sure that you personalize that LinkedIn profile. And then when you're um, creating your resume, again, make sure it's tailored. Um, so highlight the fact that you've possibly had interactions with HCPs or KOLs. You've been able to work cross-functionally. So kind of ticking off all these boxes that you know are relevant, um, especially in your resume, because if it's going through some kind of um, a system like ATS, those words, uh, words that come up, they get flagged. And if you don't have them, you could automatically get rejected even before a human set eyes on your resume. Um, and then when you're having interviews, again, showcasing what your soft skills are, um, not just, you know, the other skills that you bring to the table. Um, and then I think the big key thing that's an advantage if you're a clinician is showing that you not only understand um, the physician perspective, but you also understand the patient perspective. Um, because at the end of the day, that's the huge commonality between the industry and a practicing clinician, it's really putting the patient first. Yeah, thank you. That's a lot of uh, good information and I think very um, helpful to hear that. All right, so we are moving now to another question for George. Um, let's see, this uh, registrant asked, as a recent PharmD, 
PGY1 pharmacy resident trying to enter industry after residency. How can I make my skills transferable to enter the field without an industry background? Great, great question. So uh, congrats on PGY1. I also completed a PGY1 in drug information. Mine could have been different because it was specifically drug information and gravitated more towards the pharmaceutical industry. Like Jeepty mentioned, it's important to read MSL job description because when you read one, two, 10 of them, you're going to see a combination of skills that they need. And those are the things that you're trying to highlight. As you're going through your residency, I was fortunate in my own that I had the opportunity to modify certain parts of it. Like I need practical experience where it meant I had to work a little extra in order to get that experience. So if it was not in the syllabus for my residency, I look for opportunities outside of it because I had a specific goal I'm trying to achieve. So if you're not having opportunities to do clinical presentation, that is something you can raise your hand on. There are always journal clubs. You can lead journal clubs. If you are looking for a specific, you also want to make sure as you're going through your residency, you're gravitating towards a therapeutic area. So if you come out, you can speak either to a specific thing because if it's a general residency, it may be very, very difficult to prove to someone that you are the disease state expert, which is the MSL role. So there are two things you're proving. You are a disease state expert, which mostly comes with PGY2 or a PGY1 where the person actually decides to make the best out of it. So there are different avenues within the PGY1 program. Understanding the ML, MSL role, you can find projects that can really speak to that. So highly encourage, go to LinkedIn, go to Indeed, go to any job posting website, look at those keywords, the main things that they're looking for, that is common besides your therapeutic area expertise, and try to make sure that you can answer yes to all of them in a way that can be convincing. So for myself, I have to, pull back from experience as an educator in Cameroon. I can communicate with people. I can pull from maybe accounting or teaching in pharmacy school to say, I have been able to ex uh, exercise leadership. I have business acumen. Those are some common things that we see there. And as you do all of that, you're making a case for a particular disease state. Very, very important. Yeah, I think that's great. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think it's really important, as you mentioned, George, to sort of think outside the box when you're trying to uncover those aspects of your background that will enable you to be a good MSL and just kind of digging out those transferable skills even without industry experience is important. Um, we did get two related questions in the chat. So I uh, think we should address them now with George. Um, so the first uh, was being, could a PharmD go from a sales position to an MSL position? And if so, what would MSL recruiters be looking for um, in terms of experience for that individual? Cool. Great, yeah, I, I, I think I know a few people who have done that transition from sales to MSL, not the very easy part because you're learning a new language. So the bigger part of the role of an MSL is to make sure that you stay very clear from the commercial team. So if you are in the commercial team or in sales, I want to make a case on MSL, you have to learn MSL language and start retiring. Well, I mean, in your brain, you retire some of the sales language. That way, a recruiter or hiring manager would not be concerned about compliance. So you have to actually be able to get to the Pharma Code Sunshine Act and actually see where that line kind of is drawn. That is the only way, and that is one of the ways you can prove to someone that they should be comfortable enough that you're not coming to do um, sales speak, but medical speak. That's very important. I've seen a few people who have done the transition. It takes some effort and conscious calculation. Okay, I think um, another related question, um, and maybe all the panelists could comment on this as well. Um, but again, just again with the uh, sales question, is it helpful to showcase on your resume that you do have sales experience within industry or maybe not in industry? Um, because let's see, um, Jacqueline, our audience member said that she notices that for field application scientists, they use sales techniques. Um, they move into the MSL role, even though the MSL role is not sales-based. So just wondering what anyone thinks about in general, leaving sales experience on your resume or not. 
I, 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 I would still go back to those keywords, right? Is it relationships building? They are. They may be building a wide range of relationships. So most of the people I see, the people on my sales team may still see them, but in a different capacity. But that is still relationship building. So moving from that one, you, you just want to make sure you know what the different roles do in with interacting with those people. So if I was a salesperson um, and I've covered a territory for, for quite some time and I know all the people who matter, that can be my own value proposition, right? I already have these relationships that I can bring. But you have to speak a language that proves to the hiring manager you're not coming to put um, us in compliance hot water. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you, George. I think, you know, I, the, the sales experience and those skills are certainly transferable and highlighting the fact that, you know, you know how to go out and, and uh, establish and maintain relationships. You kind of know the, um, how to, you know, interact with accounts and identify the key players within an account. So, so a lot of those um, functions that the sales rep does, you kind of do the same thing as in a MSL, but just with a different intention, really. Um, so I think certainly it's it's worthwhile highlighting. Um, but again, just you know, really understanding the the differences between the roles and being able to speak to that, both you know in your resume and then when you're interviewing to make it clear that you understand how different it is, um, would be really important. Yeah, I think all really great points. And I've heard these, we've seen these questions on previous webinars before too. And um, I think sometimes it's difficult to speak to how to actually use that sales experience if you don't have the experience, because as all of you mentioned, we're all exposed to the rules of compliance as MSLs. So making sure you're able to draw that line and keep things black and white as an MSL is, is definitely important. So we have a, a few questions that were directed towards all of the panelists. They're a bit more general that we'd love to hear your insights and inputs on. And it's one of them is quite related to a question that was just submitted by um, Rachel in the chat. So she asked, were any of you undecided between the MSL and medical writer? If so, what made you decide on the MSL role? And I'll follow that up quickly with one that was submitted by a different registrant. Um, that was kind of more focused on the transitional roles or possible transitional roles between coming from whatever you were doing as your background to the MSL role, such as a clinical research coordinator or science writing, medical writing. So something that you would use to sort of get your foot in the door with industry before breaking in. And we'd love to hear from all three of you or whoever would like to contribute. Uh, I mean, speaking from my experience, I'd say that uh, I kind of approached it with a very broad stroke. So I started looking at all the different areas um, that clinicians went into. And so I did kind of consider medical writing brief briefly. Um, what the MSR role in medical writing has in common is the fact that you have a deep interest in science and you're willing to discuss it. However, it's uh, more in the written communication rather than the verbal aspect of it and for me having that interaction with people and having face-to-face -face conversations albeit not necessarily in person <laughs> and virtually as well but um, for me that was a strong fact that swayed me towards the MSL role and also just the fact that um, as you guys again are probably becoming very aware the MSL role is so multifaceted um, each day each week is entirely different um, you could be uh, the face that you could be engaging with KOLs one day, um, having conversations about investigate initiated trials another day, um, working with cross-functional um, colleagues in marketing and depending on what the products that the company have and where it is in its life cycle really affects what your role is. Um, but for me, it just felt like there was a lot going on and that excited me because every day was different. Um, but each to their own, it's of course what attracts you about that specific job. Yeah, I, I think I can just add a point there because my residency was in one of those transition roles. Like so, so some people would consider going through medical information, drug information, medical writing. So I did my residency in drug information and I used that to make sure that I can connect what I did in drug information with what the MSL does on the field. Like how does the internal, the in-house team support them? So I can speak that language. And then I would use now that 
to make a case like I understand inside and I understand outside, I understand when to ask for help. So all of those roles, I part of the MSL role supporting clinical trials, I do my part. They are, we have clinical research associates and different people in the clinical research, uh, research space. If I was in clinical research and I want to become an MSL, I'm going to understand what is the difference between my role, what is the similarity between my role and the MSL role. That way I can talk about skills that I gained as a CRA that are similar to what I knew my MSL counterparts were doing. So it's just being in that space, understanding what an MSL does reading those job descriptions, and then you'll be able to um, repurpose that to talk, speak to your specific um, experiences. Great, great points by both of you. I feel like I don't have, <laughs> I feel like I don't have too much to add because you guys hit all the high points, but um, I, I think any of those roles give you valuable experience, um, you know, whether you're a CRA or in medcoms or medical writing or, you know, late stage research, whatever it is. Um, I think they all bring some kind of value to the table, and I would say, you know, it, it's it's very common to see what someone in that role then make the transition to MSL. But it's also pretty common for people to just, to just jump straight into the MSL role as well. So you definitely see both. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to do one or the other. Um, I think a, a lot of it probably just depends on on your individual situation. You know how. How long do you have to look? Some people have a clock, you know, especially especially if you're in a residency and you know there's a, a finite end, or if you're a postdoc and you know your funding's running out, <laughs> or something like that. Then you have some more constraints, right? Everybody has different individual um, constraints, like geography and whether you're will, willing to move, uh, you know, how big of a territory you want, stuff like that. So I think just thinking about you know what your own um, situation is and, and what's probably going to fit your situation best is, is going to help guide you. And then again, just stick with what you're interested in, because, you know, I, I have a lot of friends who are in these roles, uh, not, not necessarily MSL roles, but just, you know, their careers in general, and they're not, they're not real happy with them. Um, and, and, you know, whether it's a poor, uh, poor culture, or they don't like the day-to-day, the -day or they don't like the um, the company or whatever it is, you know, I think a lot of people are unhappy with their jobs. So I would highly encourage you to find a job that you're very happy with. And I, I constantly joke with my wife that I have a fake job because I don't really feel like I'm working um, because it's fun. You know, I get to basically be a social science nerd um, and, you know, work remotely, go for a run before I do webinars, stuff like that. So it's great. Um, but it's not for everyone. You know, I think uh, I, I have a lot of really good friends who, I think would be excellent MSLs, but they have no interest in traveling. <laughs> so that in and of itself more or less eliminates, you know, the possibility, but, you know, they have the right personality for it. They obviously are, are very, uh, you know, acute and technically and, and stuff like that. But so at the end of the day, I think, you know, look, look inward, see what, you know, have a good understanding of what motivates you and what excites you. And if that matches up with the MSL role, then that's great. And if it doesn't, there are a lot of other really good options out there. Um, like, and a lot of them are already listed in, <laughs> in the chat, like medcoms, medical writing, business development. Um, one that people don't really talk about is, is con uh, consulting. Um, a lot of consulting firms like, like the um, uh, McKinsey's of the world, they, they tend to like to recruit um, terminal degree scientists. Um, to write some of their, you know, analyst reports and things like that. Um, and then I think the other thing I would, I would encourage you to do as well is, um, I, I saw earlier in the chat, there's a question about informational interviews. And I, that's like two thumbs up for me, because um, I don't know about you guys, but like, if you Google my medical science liaison, it's really hard to get a good description of the role. And despite being an MSL for almost three years now, I still don't really know how to describe my role. So uh, I think it takes a lot of, uh, you know, intentional research to really understand the role and be able to speak to it. And that will really come through in an inter in, in interview if you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so definitely talk to people who are in the MSL role. Just be like, hey, what does your day-to-day -day look like? What are your, what do you like about the job? What do you not like about the job? Uh, you know, how did you get your job? <laughs> stuff like that. All the stuff that you would kind of ask anyone about their, their career if you were interested in pursuing it. Um, but I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to do that because uh, it is a very hard role to understand. And it is a very hard role to describe when you're at a social function and so someone says, hey, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> so if you can answer that question off the bat, then I think you're, you're probably doing um, pretty well compared to a lot of the other candidates out there. I think that's really great advice from all three of you. And just to follow that up quickly, we'd love to hear a little bit of a, a taste of how the three of you approach the informational interview process. Um, I'm going to have a quick shout out to someone on this call right now, somebody I know from graduate school and from my postdoc informational interviewed me the other day and and but if you don't know somebody what kind of what kind of approach do you what do you use and and there's always the sentiment of wanting to provide value so kind of how do you approach that situation. Yeah, I think I think um, the first thing to me is that the first value that anyone can do is that, that first step, that respectful first step to reach out to someone, right? You have seen that the person has some success or something that you want to benefit from and you respectfully seek it, not with a connect on LinkedIn, but with either a message, hello, I'm George, I'm a drug information resident interested in this and these are some things I've worked with. I would like to hear your journey. I, you, I listen to Tom Caravella's podcast, MSL Talk, it's a one popular one as well. Um, and one of the things I did, I connected almost with all of the people who came there to, to speak. Like, oh, I really love this thing you said about this. I'm not able to translate it in my current role. Do you have a minute? And I tell you, most of those people had a minute, five minutes and 10 minutes. So those are the kind of things. And once they offer the time, make sure you have questions that really can, 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 can show that you value the time, right? think kind of high level, what kind of specific things can you, can you ask? It's good to ask about the day in their life. It's good to ask about how they got it. Well, maybe through LinkedIn, you can see their profile. So just don't ask me whether I went to University of Maryland. I went there, right? So that's kind of a few seconds we didn't use, right? So just do that little back and research so that if the person gives you five minutes, they can remember those five minutes as well. And one of the things I did at the end of most of my um, conversations, I was like, hey, if anything comes up in your company I'm applying, are you willing to give me a referral, right? So it's not awkward when I see it and I need it at some point. And many people say yes, and it helped. Uh, great points, George. And uh, I shout out to some of the folks on here, like Shay and Mia have, have informational interviewed me as well. And uh, I, I would, uh, first of all, agree with everything George said. And I would maybe add that, um, you know, most of us have been in, your, in the same shoes and are very happy to pay it forward because we did the exact same thing you, did, you are doing now. <laughs> a few years ago. So I, I really don't mind talking to people, especially because, you know, most of us spend a fair amount of time on the road, whether we're in airports or in cars or whatever. And that is really good time to talk to people on the phone, <laughs> because the last thing I want to do is, you know, drive three hours in silence. Uh, although that, sometimes that does sound appealing since I have three loud kids. Um, but, uh, you know, most most MSLs, I think, are, are very willing to pay for just because, you know, A, it's good networking because you want to you want to meet good people and hire good people and you want to work with good people and so if you have an opening on your team and you know you've had someone that you spoke with recently then then you can tell your hiring manager like hey you know I, I spoke with George the other day I think he'd be a great candidate he doesn't have experience but just you know let me send you his resume and get, let you talk to him and see what you think um, so that can be a really good thing because I think most of us probably have had at least one or two teammates over the years that, that you don't really care for, or, you know, you're kind of glad when they leave, stuff like that. And so you want to, you know, have a list of, of great people in different therapeutic areas and different geographies that um, when the opportunity comes, you can be like, hey, I know someone in Maryland or, hey, I know someone in, in Los Angeles and, you know, give them the referral. So it is a little bit selfish sometimes too, um, but, but it is somewhat, um, you know, that, that pay it forward mentality too. And the other thing I would say is try and find someone who maybe um, you can, you have something in common with. Like when I was looking, I would look for um, PhDs who made the jump, you know, without a, a transitional role and just be like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a PhD. I'm in my postdoc right now. I'm trying to make the transition as well. And then I even took it a step further and 
would take a look uh, specifically at people with a kinesiology PhD because it is kind of an uncommon uh, degree to go into pharma with. You see a lot of people in like biomedical engineering, biomedical sciences, you know, genetics, stuff like that. Um, but you don't see a lot of like kinesiology people in um, in pharma. And so all I think I probably found like three or four of them, and they were all super interested in talking, super helpful, and they were like, "Oh, we're glad we're not the only ones anymore." Um, so definitely, you know, if you can find someone who has something in common with you, same university, same therapeutic area, same, you know, geography, or, you know, sometimes people post on LinkedIn that they like a certain sports team, like, you know, I spent three years in Alabama, so anyone who likes the University of Alabama, uh, I can, I can always connect with, or Indiana. So anyway, uh, all these kind of things that you would, you know, use in the field once you're in the role, use those same techniques that uh, when you look for people to inter informational interview on LinkedIn. Um, I mean, both of you made great points. Um, George's points about how to network, because when I started, um, I think I had 30 connections on LinkedIn and slowly built up my network. Um, so I struggled to wonder how to approach that. Um, George is textbook, um, at someone who did it so successfully and so well to the point that when we were on a clubhouse, Tom Caravella recognized him because he'd attended so many of them and he'd spoken up and asked questions. So he made his presence known um, and that had a huge impact when he then went on to connect with these people. So um, that was uh, like that definitely try and uh, approach every connection thoughtfully. Um, and then when you are having informational conversations, if you can try and target not just MSLs, um, but also hiring managers as well, because uh, if you are fortunate enough to connect with them, these are the people that potentially down the road um, might remember you and uh, will think back to whether you impressed them, either with how articulate you were or your background. Um, and then the last point I wanted to make was that think of every informational conversation like it's an interview. So sometimes it's really easy to go into a conversation and it's great to connect with someone and start talking about your life and how you got there and woe is me and these are the challenges I've faced. But actually think of it as a chance to really sell yourself. So after all the small talk, uh, try and then start weaving into the conversation how you think you'd be great for a role in the future because those things might stick. And again, a few months down the line, if they've got an opening on their team or they see a posting, they might send it over to you or recommend you. Great, and, and, and another shout out to, to Heather and uh, Pharma Finders because they have lots of resources I used to just go and I go to LinkedIn Pharma Finder, see what they're posting, right? Um, it can be just some tips on uh, making connections. It can be tips on building relationships, which is just important. It's a quick read and you can expand. And then they have events where people come and speak. And being at those events, I would say, is the closest way to, to, to really get to meet a huge number of people at once. Yeah, thanks everyone. That was a uh all really good input and advice. Um, kind of following up, uh, I know we've had a lot of mention of Heather, who I do not personally know yet, um, but we did have a question. Um, how common is it to break into the role from a referral? And really bigger picture, I think it might be interesting if you each comment on how you found your role. Did you just cold apply to a LinkedIn posting? Did you have a referral? Did you use a recruiter? Um, because there's a lot of different ways as we know, to get into the role. So yeah, just if you guys could comment on that. Who wants to start? Maybe, uh, let me start uh, and I'll keep it brief. I had the opportunity to create a, an applicant uh, profile after I had submitted an application through LinkedIn, right? So when I went to the company website, and I saw my application that went through LinkedIn, it was a disaster. So if you see a position on LinkedIn, go and look up that position on the company website because the templates don't really translate the way you see it. Your name is going to either be your title or something else. So that's one important thing I, I, I kind of learned. Now, about referral, very, very important. That is why I mentioned if you have informational interviews, and you feel like it was warm, the person is kind of welcoming one or two of those interviews, 
just uh, slide that question, can you provide me a referral? Because what the referral does for the most part is that it helps your resume to skip these brutal robots that look for every word and every syntax and every semantics that you have on your resume, which is not correct, right? So I would highly, highly encourage that. It's, um, it, it's something that if you can have a million of, there is no disadvantage. Dip, do you want to go ahead or do you want me to go ahead? Um, I'll go ahead. Um, uh, Renje and I've already mentioned Heather. Um, so I was fortunate enough to um, have Heather reach out to me um, and tell me about a position that was available. Um, but the way that Heather and I got in contact in the first place was that Pharma Finders um, organized a series of webinars and, um, you know, much like lots of other recruiting companies and ask and tell where you have an opportunity to network with other people. Um, and I found this session very useful and reached out to Heather and the team just to say, um, express my gratitude um, and mention that I was looking for an MSL role. Uh, and so when that came, I sent my resume, of course, and then when a role came up that aligned with my background, um, then we could proceed um, down that interview route. Um, and also coincidentally, the speaker on the webinar that I'd attended uh, was one of the hiring managers for this role. Uh, and I'd happened to reach out to him and had an informational conversation with him. So even before the interview, we already had that rapport and he already knew about me, my background, um, which I think really helped with me getting the job. Yep. And um, I, I would, I know we've all mentioned Heather already, but, um, you know, well, first of all, Heather is like one of my favorite people in the whole world. And that's not just because you like Michigan, uh, but it's, it's, um, it's one of those things where, you know, if you can find a recruiter who, you know, actually takes the time to get to know you, to know what your background is, what your interests are, and, and then finds roles that are well-suited for you and not just any role, um, I think that can be really helpful. So, and that takes time and effort and not all recruiters will do that. Um, I, I've worked with so many bad ones that uh, I wish I could forget like one recruiter, um, you know, sent, sent me a position that was completely in the wrong geography. And I was like, you know, it sounds like a really interesting position, but like, I don't really want to move to Nebraska. Um, I, you know, I, I live in California and I want to move to Indiana. Um, so, to, you know, make sure that it, it is a two way street. Um, you know, not only are they trying to help you, but you're, you know, you're a candidate who can fill a role for them. So, so definitely make sure you work with good ones. I think the other thing, and, and actually Heather is the one who told me this, don't be afraid to work with multiple recruiters, Sembio and uh, Pharma Finders and the Carolyn Group. And I can't even remember all the other ones, uh, Trinet, and our, these are all ones that um, I've personally had interactions with. Um, you know, they, they all have good people in them. Um, and I think it, it would, uh, you'd be selling yourself short if you only, you know, uh, pigeonholed yourself into one. Um, so recruiters definitely help a lot. And then to George's point, I don't know if I know of anybody who has successfully gotten a job by applying through the website. <laughs> um, so I would encourage you to, before you go ahead and do that, see if you know somebody at the company. If you don't, see if you know a recruiter that you know um, is recruiting for that company or maybe know somebody who is. Um, because I would say, I don't know what the percentage is, but I'd be vent I would venture to say like over 90% of the time when you apply through the, through the website, it gets lost in the, you know, uh, the, the internet. <laughs> Who knows where it goes? Mark Zuckerberg probably has it somewhere. Um, but uh, it will probably go to an automated screen, computer screener. And like I think George or, or Dipti mentioned earlier, if you don't have certain keywords, then the, the computer is gonna kick your application out and you'll never hear anything. You won't even get a rejection letter. Um, if by some chance you do get past the computer, then it, it will get looked at probably by a human eye, but from HR, not the hiring manager. And the same thing's gonna happen. The HR person's gonna spend about 45 seconds looking through your, your resume. If you don't check boxes X, Y, and Z, same thing, you get put in the rejection pile. And so that's already two different you know, hurdles that you have to go overcome before you even get to the hiring manager. So if you have someone 
a real human, whether it's a recruiter or a referral who can actually get your stuff to the right person, that will save you a lot of time and headache. Um, and, and that goes not just for aspiring MSLs, but, but I would say for any role. Um, like I recently just made the switch from my first MSL role to now my second, and um, that happens through a recruiter. Um, so I would I would encourage you to you know really work on building that network, um, whether it's through LinkedIn or other uh, you know organic conversations or webinars or looking up medical affairs recruiting companies. Definitely. Um, uh, and for those of you who don't know who we're talking about, I'm going to specifically point out Heather Barlow down here. If you see her in the um, in the video, Heather's a, a, a recruiter, and I see she's posted in the chat. So definitely reach out to her, um, and, and she can give you the the lay of the land if you're really serious about you know getting getting into uh, an MSL role. Thanks, everyone. I also, like Lindsay, have not met Heather, so nice to meet you, Heather. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, Lindsay and I do not know Heather, um, but it sounds like she is a great resource, and uh, she's suggesting that everyone can connect with her um, through the chat, so thanks for all of your input. Uh, we're, def we're coming up on an hour, um, but we want to close the session with a question or a variation of a question that we typically ask all of our speakers. And that's if you were your former self before your MSL role, either in graduate school, either in your transitional role in clinical, in clinical pharmacy, wherever you were, what is one piece of advice that you would give your former, former self or asked a little bit differently? What's one thing you wish you would have known? And we'd like to hear from all of you on this. I wish I would have known how fun this role was. I would have probably started looking sooner um, instead, uh, you know, I spent three years in a postdoc and didn't learn about this role until like three months before I left. Um, and, you know, I would also say that uh, by, by probably sheer happenstance, I think I, I was able to get a lot of experiences in my postdoc through the clinical translational tra uh, science training program through three different, you know, industry uh, projects that we had. Um, in my postdoc lab that, um, you know, really helped prepare me well for this role. Uh, like I said, I think it was sheer happenstance because when I went into my postdoc, um, I was working on these projects with zero intention of making the transition to industry. And then um, just by dumb luck was able to translate that um, further. So I would say, you know, on a serious note, if you can find experiences that, that um, help you you know, gain the skills and work on projects and, and things that have touch points with the industry or help you better understand it, um, I would encourage you to do that. And, and that a lot of times that involves stuff that your boss isn't necessarily happy about or doesn't want you to do. And I would just encourage you to have the courage to, to do it anyway. Um, and the other thing I would say is just be honest. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, uh, I know, especially in academic research, a lot of people, you know, hear industry and they think it's a dirty word um, and they don't like talking about it with their bosses. So I, I can't tell you how many pres or aspiring MSLs I've talked to who have been like, well, you know, I haven't told my boss that I'm looking in this industry yet. And, I, and you know, I know there's going to be some people out there, some mentors out there who will react negatively. And, and that totally sucks. Um, but I would encourage you to find people in the department or outside the department or, you know, maybe your chair or something like that, um, who will advocate for your best interest and who will help support you in your journey, um, even if it's not your PhD mentor or your postdoc mentor, um, because in the long run, you have to look out for your own career. Um, and that totally, um, you know, sucks to not have the support of your mentor. Um, but sometimes the conversation goes better than you think. Um, like when I told my postdoc mentor that I wanted an industry role, um, the first thing he said was, well, first of all, he was silent for about 10 seconds and it felt like an eternity. Um, and I was like, I don't know what to expect here. Um, and then he said, you know, I think you'd be really good at that role. Um, and, the, and then his next question was, you know, what can I do to help? Can I make some calls for you? You know, I work with Vertex a whole bunch, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then came all the probing questions like, hey, you know, I thought you just submitted this grant. I thought you wanted to continue this line of research, blah, blah, blah. blah. So those, those questions will happen. And there's nothing wrong with that because I think it helps you think uh, hard and fast about why you want to make that change. And if you don't have a good answer to tell your boss, then what are you going to say in an interview? 
<laughs> you know, so don't be afraid of that. But um, I would encourage you to be honest with your with your mentor, um, find a champion or an advocate for yourself, whether it's your mentor or somebody else or both. Um, and, and make sure you continue to communicate with them and find ways to stay in touch with them um, af after you leave. Like it's been three years since I left UAB. I just talked to my postdoc mentor for about a half hour on the phone last week because I, I saw he's actually becoming the uh, CSO at CF Foundation. So it's like, oh, I just called him up and I'm like, hey, congrats. <laughs> and we wound up catching up. So, um, you know, keep those relationships alive. Don't burn any bridges, uh, kind of all your, your typical professional conduct stuff. I think um, the things that I kind of learned through this process are that some of the cliches are true. Um, so everyone says it's a tough role to get into. And once you're into it, it's easy to then suddenly get inundated with recruiter requests and suddenly you'll start getting um, interview emails drop into your inbox. Um, so it does seem like a treacherous road, but it is possible. Um, it just requires a lot of determination, perseverance, um, and just positivity. Um, and then the second cliche is that it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, of course, this assumes a background uh, knowledge. So, uh, you know, you need to be sound clinically or scientifically. Um, but really, I think it was once I started building up my network, networking with the right people and making meaningful connections. It's not about um, trying to increase your LinkedIn network number. It's about making connections with people that you're either learning from um, because they're on the same journey as you or people that are a few steps ahead of you. Um, but either way, make sure that you use your time smartly and efficiently. Um, especially when you're working and you don't have an unlimited amount of time to dedicate to transitioning um, and enjoy the process because hopefully it will be worth it in the end. Um, great, I'll keep it short. The one thing I wish I learned early was that my resume did not need to be four pages long. So if I got feedback from someone with my four page resume, I said, oh, just you can cut this. I don't think this is relevant. I resisted until I stop resisting and the two-page resume works for me. So if you reach out to people and you ask for feedback on your resume, really take the time to value their good intention and really put time to consider them. Um, I finally got the job with a two-page resume and I started with a four-page. So that's something I really wish I, I, didn't, I didn't resist that advice. Great advice, everyone. So we're about at an hour. Um, we wanna be respectful of everyone's time. And I know there are some questions both in the chat and raised hands that we were unable to address, but as all of the panelists have suggested and offered, um, feel free to reach out via LinkedIn, um, build those connections, make those meaningful relationships as everyone has mentioned. And we wanna thank you all for attending, but most importantly, thank our three panelists who have been awesome and have provided so much invaluable advice and support to all the aspiring MSLs out there. You've all got it. Um, just take everybody's advice to heart and I hope all of these notes and insights from this session will be useful to you in your futures. So thank you all so, so much. Um, we actually have a really brief announcement that Lindsay and I wanna share, um, but we want to also see all the chats coming in. Thanks to you all. Um, and any final words from Dipti, Renje, or George, feel free to, to share those um, before Lindsay and I jump into a quick announcement. Well, I'll just say thank you, Lindsay and, and Renee, for you know inviting us to be here. It's really nice to uh, be a part of the Ask and Tell um, family now. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming. It's always, uh, you know, I, a lot of times I sign up for these things and I'm afraid I'm going to be the only one here. So um, thanks for making it an engaging conversation. And I saw George um, post in the chat, uh, you know, feel free to connect on LinkedIn. I would definitely echo that. Um, feel, you, you guys obviously have all our names from the, from the flyers. So feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to connect with all of you afterwards and good luck. Yep, good luck. Uh, the fact that you guys are all here shows that you guys are committed and dedicated to it. So um, have that belief in yourself and keep going. And thank you again, Lindsay and Renee. This is an aspirational goal for me being on here. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 I can resonate that. It's like a dream being here. And all I would say <laughs> to all the people trying and going through the application is try again, fail again, feel better. It, <laughs> it will get you to that. So you don't, you don't give up. Just keep persisting. All right. Um, okay, so Renee, do you have it pulled up or do you want? I do, yeah. Okay, um, so real well, quickly guys, we just wanted to make um, an announcement. Um,